America, even though we started aviation with the Wright brothers, we fell behind the curve pretty quickly. Aviation, uh, public's view, was somewhere between a circus and a rich man's sport. With what was happening in Europe, technology advanced so fast, we didn't even keep up. Towards the end of World War I, the U.S. Airmail Service decided to start flying U.S. Airmail. During World War I, 1914 to 1918, there was a lot of progress made in aviation, but almost none by America. We got involved in the war late, we almost exclusively used foreign design, and so in 1918, when the war ended, the airmail service was first adopted and, and utilized, but almost completely with foreign designs. People had big plans for what was going to happen in Wyoming for aviation. The person that basically pushed this to the forefront was none other than General Billy Mitchell. And he obviously realized the significance of having a military aviation arm, if nothing else, to protect both coasts of the United States in the event of an unforeseen attack. Well, Congress refused, didn't really want to help, and so he decided to come up with something that would change the game. And so, in the summer of 1919, he began to formulate ideas for having what later became known as the Transcontinental Air Reliability Test. The Transcontinental Air Reliability Test utilized a route that largely followed the Union Pacific Railroad. This allowed for a prominent, continuous landmark that pilots could follow from coast to coast. The military tried several different types of aircraft for the test, experimenting to see which could best handle the rugged terrain. The DH-4, built by the British manufacturer de Havilland, was pegged as the best to handle the job and was used through the 1920s as the preferred aircraft of the airmail, especially in the Rocky Mountain region. Eventually, the air race was concluded and a good number of the pilots actually were able to successfully fly across the continent. People began to question whether or not this was something worthwhile. There is somebody back east who was paying a great deal of attention, Otto Prager, who was the Assistant Postmaster General for the United States Post Office. Well, I think Otto Prager was also a forward thinker and saw aviation as something that could be later utilized in a more effective fashion, which the airmail certainly did. Prager decided that they would establish an early route between Washington, D.C. and New York with a stop at Philadelphia. After about two weeks, it ran on schedule pretty good. And what that did is it established all of the difficulties they were going to face to go transcontinental. Once he saw, along with his boss, Postmaster Burleson, saw that it was possible to fly aircraft safely across the United States, even in weather conditions that these pilots faced during the transcontinental reliability test, they decided that this is an opportunity that they just couldn't pass up. In the beginning, when the visual airway was laid out, Otto Prager sent his most glib salesman west to convince every town along the proposed airway to build an airport. The post office didn't have any money. So he relied on the goodwill of local municipalities to establish airports. At this point in time, what was really driving why Prager and Burleson were looking to do this was that Congress was never a friend of the airmail service. And they were looking to cancel all the funding for the airmail services that had already been uh, put into service back on the East Coast. And they thought together that this would be an excellent way to demonstrate the real value of air transport of the mails. Prager worked hard to familiarize himself with the weather and terrain of the proposed route. Based on these studies, he became convinced that Cheyenne would be a great place to establish an airfield for the U.S. airmail. And he said that it's true that there were 64 days of high wind, but that's not too bad. That can be dealt with. But there were only a few days of thunderstorms and a few days where snow or fog would shut everything down. And so Cheyenne actually had, in his estimation, better weather than Chicago. And so he thought this would be an excellent place for it to go. Rock Springs established an airport to serve as another depot on the main route. 
Secondary emergency airfields were established in places like Rollins, Evanston, and Laramie. Today it's difficult to imagine Cheyenne being a center of aviation with Denver being just a hub. This worked for Wyoming the same way the railroad did. We have the gangplank, it doesn't have any huge mountain peaks, and so it made it more practical for the airmail. The other reason, <laughs> practically speaking, is you didn't have advanced maps, you didn't have radio stations, and so the airmail pilots essentially followed what they called the Iron Compass which was the railroad. The City Fathers, uh, the Union Pacific Railroad, Laramie County and others decided to use an airfield that was approximately one mile out in the middle of nowhere north of the Capitol building that was owned by the city that should be used for an airfield. And that's the location of the airfield that we have today and that's where it was originated. Once the route was established, Prager and the post office were able to measure their success by the time it took to deliver mail from one coast to the other. Their main competition, the railroad, was the standard they were racing. It took a train almost three and a half days to go from New York to San Francisco. When the mail service finally got established on a regular basis, you could go from San Francisco to New York in 29 hours, and the other way in about 33, and it was longer because of the headwinds. And of course, that was extremely valuable for businesses, banks, other people that had high priority mail packets that needed to be transported. And so he thought this was going to be an excellent idea. He even came out to Cheyenne and to various communities along the route to actually say so, to drum up more community support to help it happen. With the limitations in technology during the early days of the transcontinental airmail system, Congress was convinced that using the railroad to transport mail was more reliable than the airmail. In early 1921, they threatened to cut funding for the airmail. Prager wasn't ready to give up just yet. And so he decided he needed some kind of gimmick or some kind of spectacular event to prove that airmail was superior to rail in all categories for delivering the fast mails, that he came up with a plan to fly the airmail by night. Prager's plan was to fly mail from both coasts toward the other through the night to show the significant time advantage that airmail offered. In 1921, pilots still relied on using landmarks to find their way. Flying at night was extremely hazardous. So they came up with this idea. All along the route, they got the post office to try and find employees, volunteers, farmers, ranchers, what have you. And what they would do on this night of February 22nd, a blisteringly cold day, one of the worst weather days that they had seen in years. But they convinced these people to take their automobiles, go to airfields like Cheyenne, or go to ranches that are out near the Union Pacific Railroad. And what these, they asked these people to do is to leave their headlights on, pointing in the direction <laughs> of the Union Pacific Railroad tracks or east and west so that a pilot up in the sky would be able to see these things. And they did this every 50 miles along the entire route between Chicago and San Francisco and even through the east. Airway superintendents and pilots who started from New York heading west quickly determined that the weather was much too hazardous to risk flying. If there was going to be any hope, pilots flying eastward from San Francisco would have to fly through the storms. With some difficulty, the mail got to Salt Lake City, where Frank Yeager was to take over and fly the portion between Salt Lake and North Platte, Nebraska. He was able to make it with a stop in Cheyenne, battling a horrible storm through the rugged skies of Wyoming. And Frank Yeager lands at North Platte. And here is Jack Knight waiting, and the storm is brewing and getting worse all the time. And they trade off the mail, and true to his word, without missing a beat, Jack Knight takes off to finish the last leg of his day to fly from North Platte all the way to Omaha, Nebraska. Well, when he gets to Omaha, Nebraska, about 8 o'clock at night, the weather is giving a little bit of a break there, but it's so bad all around Omaha that the pilot that was waiting for the airmail at Omaha refused to go any further. He thought it was far, far too dangerous. So everybody looks at Jack Knight. He says, well, I think I'll do it. I'll give it a try. And he says, uh, I need a coffee and cigarette. And you got any map around here? Jack Knight bravely struck out towards Iowa City in the midst of horrendous storms on a portion of the airmail route he had never flown before all under the cover of a dark, storm-laden night. 
With the help of an emergency airfield worker in Iowa, Jack was able to refuel his plane and continue toward Chicago. At 6 a.m., people in Chicago somehow had heard that Jack Knight had taken off from an Omaha and was attempting to make the flight from Omaha to Chicago. Well, people in their thousands were coming out to see what would happen. And sure enough, at 6 o'clock in the morning, they heard an engine of Jack Knight's mail plane coming out of the darkness and the swirling fog after the storms. Just as the sun broke over the horizon, Jack Knight circles the Chicago airfield and then brings his plane in for an almost perfect landing on an ice-covered landing field. The staff there at the post office airfield immediately get the airmail bags out of Jack Knight's plane. They put it inside another waiting aircraft and then they had to cut Jack Knight out of his plane. His flight suit had frozen solid inside the aircraft. Jack Knight became an overnight folk hero. The U.S. airmail system was safe for the moment from getting their budget cut. Congress realized that the U.S. airmail system could become a viable option for moving mail across the country more efficiently than the railroad. However, because of the dangerous circumstances that the pilots faced that night, the post office decided that they shouldn't try night flying again until technology allowed pilots to more safely and reliably navigate in the darkness. And in the beginning, the planes would take off from San Francisco eastbound and fly all day, arrive at Cheyenne late in the evening. Planes from the east coast would fly west and arrive in Chicago in the evening. And then the mail would be put on a train eastbound at Cheyenne and at Chicago to go westbound. They knew at the time to be a complete service and to benefit the economy that it had to be a 24-7 operation. In other words, they had to fly at night. So there was this gap between Cheyenne and Chicago, all right? And what that led to is the first lighted airway. And the airway from Cheyenne to Chicago was about 885 miles. And it was ideally located because that part was flat. It was close to power that the beacons needed. In 1923, understanding the difficulties that pilots faced flying at night, Representatives from the post office worked with companies like Sperry, Westinghouse, and American Gas Accumulator to develop lighting and navigation technology. So in July of 1923, the airway was lit from Cheyenne to Chicago, but it developed a whole new technology specifically for airways because the pilots had to operate in three dimensions. So it's one of those rare times where technology and opportunity and vision all came together and made history. The beacon system utilized 24-inch drum-style beacons that put out over a million candle power, which pilots could see 40 miles away on a clear night. The beacons were spaced about every 10 to 15 miles, and the standard beacon tower was 51 feet high. At some of the beacon sites, an intermediate emergency airfield was developed. In Wyoming, 14 emergency airfields allowed pilots refuge when they had mechanical problems or the weather prohibited them from flying. These sites included remote places like Knight, Granger, Bitter Creek, and Medicine Bow. Well, we're standing right now on the former transcontinental airway that went from New York to San Francisco. This was an emergency field nine-tenths of a mile southeast of Medicine Bow, Wyoming. We're exactly on the Salt Lake to Omaha Airway portion. And because of the mileage, this site was designated 32. On top of this building behind me, on the south side was the large numbers 32. And on the north side over here to my left on the top of the building was in letters SL-O, which told the airmail pilot when he flew over, he was at site 32 and on the Salt Lake to Omaha Airway. We're out here today with about a 45 mile an hour wind, which is pretty typical for this part of Wyoming. As you can see, there's not much trees or mountains or anything like that to provide wind breaks, so we get the full brunt of everything right here. This was an emergency field for not only airmail pilots, but any aircraft in distress. The system was set up with a series of day markers which consisted of about 55 foot long concrete arrows laid out on the ground, all pointing to the east. And each arrow pointed to the next higher station. This arrow in particular 
points down to Rock River, which is Site 33. And Rock River pointed to Laramie, which is Site 37, and on all the way across the state. But the intermediate fields were emergency fields. They had fuel. They were staffed. The case of Medicine Bow, they lived there 24-7. They worked 12-hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off. They manned the radio and the teletype. They took weather observations. Uh, any pilots that landed there on an emergency basis, they were required to take care of, which they gave shelter or drove them into town, took the mail off and put it on the train. Uh, did minor repairs on the airplanes. Edward Cruikshank, who lived up at Medicine Bow, his annual salary was $1,200 a year. They lived in prefab houses called K Quarters. These were really remote areas, especially when you get over to like Granger and Bitter Creek and out into Nevada. But most people liked them. They led sort of an idyllic life. You could hunt and fish. You had about 90 days uh, vacation a year. So, yeah, they were pretty happy out there. A group of dedicated historians are working to resurrect and restore the Medicine Bow Airfield to portray what the site would have been like in 1929. The Medicine Bow site is also noteworthy because of its role as a golden spike of the low-frequency radio navigation system developed in the late 20s and early 30s. In March 1931, the radio navigation system at Medicine Bow went online, connecting the signals between Cheyenne and Rock Springs. At that point, the entire airway from San Francisco to New York was covered by radio navigation. And that was really a boon to air transportation because now a plane could take off in any direction, okay, and fly the transcontinental airway without ever seeing the ground irrespective of the weather. But now, when that fact came on uh, with Medicine Bow in March of 1931, uh, it changed everything. The early pilots of the airmail were some of the bravest souls ever known to mankind. When we talk about cowboys of the sky, these guys didn't ride horses. They flew airplanes that crashed a lot. In those days, uh, a pilot's breakfast was a cigarette and a cup of coffee. The early pilots got about $4,000 annually, which is really big money in the 20s. They were expected to fly all the time, period. The Wyoming Division was considered almost from the very beginning to be the very toughest of the entire airmail route. You had constant changing weather conditions, you had the high altitude, you had mountains that were thrown in the middle of all of this. It took a very unique brand of pilot that would be willing to take this on day after day. The area that Wyoming pilots usually flew was from North Platte all the way to Salt Lake City and back again. You had pilots that would fly the entire route and just land whenever it got dark or when their shift was over once they got the ability to fly at night. As much as we see I-80 closed down because of snowstorms, the airmail pilots didn't have that option. Admittedly, if there was a tornado over the field or something like that, you couldn't fly. But otherwise, they were regularly scheduled flights in aircraft that most of us wouldn't strap on in good weather. But with these aircraft, especially with the primitive engines, it was not unusual for an airmail pilot on one flight to land four times to make adjustments to his own engine just so he could finish the flight out. We would call that a crash. They called them landings. And so the risk of every flight, and when we compare them to cowboys of the air, that's fine. But on the other hand, you don't risk your life on, on, by getting on a horse. But they had an excellent completion rate normally higher than 95% of completion, somewhere around 98, sometimes, sometimes 99%, which in those days is just absolutely incredible. The pilots that came were a remarkable bunch. They, as all the airmail pilots were, they all had a certain panache. They all had a certain very strong developed sense of adventure and rugged individualism. They were risk takers, almost to the very last. And Cheyenne was home to a good number of some of the best pilots that ever flew for the United States Airmail Service. Jack Knight being one, for obvious reasons, he was a remarkable man to have here. But the airmail service also had people like uh, Dinty Moore, Jimmy Murray, Slim Lewis, Hal Collison, names that a lot of people recognize as very daring aviation pioneers. And a lot of their escapades became legendary about the conditions they were willing to fly off into without it would seem to be an instant concern about their own welfare. One of my favorite stories involving Slim Lewis is on one of his flights from Nebraska to Cheyenne, he had engine problems right outside Cheyenne. And so he had to bring his aircraft down and he brought it down at, at Wyoming Hereford Ranch, just southeast of Cheyenne. 
Well, it so happens where he decided to crash land happened to be a bull, a prize bull of Wyoming Hereford Ranch. And he landed on it and he killed it. Uh, so Wyoming Hereford Ranch logically wanted recompensed for the death of their prize bull. And they billed the post office. When the post office clerk saw the bill, his response to his supervisor by mail was, what did he extinguish an entire herd? Because obviously the post office was unaware of the price of a good bull. Congress eventually had it in for the airmail service anyway. They just bided their time. Realizing that the airmail service had been so successful, it wasn't something that Congress wanted to quite eliminate. And they passed the Kelly Airmail Act in 1925, which basically stated that the airmail service would eventually be phased out in favor of privatized companies that would then be uh, contracted to fly the airmails instead. In 1927, about, I think, September, the airmail flew its last flight. It was time to turn over everything to civil operators. At no point was the United States Post Office willing to let the airmail go. Now while they did get out of the business of hiring pilots or running the airfields, they were always consistently and constantly, and still are to this day, interested in making sure that the airmail gets through and on time, on budget, and on contract. Cheyenne, the city, bought the $600,000 facility that was pre-existing from the post office, leased the whole facility back to Boeing Air Transport. Boeing Air Transport won the contract to fly the mail from Chicago to San Francisco on what was known as Contract Airmail Route 18. The mail contracts required companies to fly passengers as well as the mail, stemming from Congress's desire to maximize the potential of commercial aviation. Because of this, Boeing developed first the Model 40 and later the Model 80, which were able to carry passengers as well as handle the terrain that the route featured. Boeing set up the base of their airmail operations in Cheyenne. When the airmail was privatized by 1927, what a lot of people don't realize, that was the beginning of what we know as modern airlines. That privatization enabled companies like Boeing Air Transport to come into existence, which became United Airlines. You had Western, you had TWA, all of those companies were first funded and started through airmail service. And so without the airmail, a lot of the companies we know of that do passenger service would have never come into being. Because of Cheyenne's deep involvement with the airmail service and the excellent relationship that they had with everybody here, there was no doubt that Cheyenne would be a significant contributor from that point on. I don't think they really realized just exactly what that would grow into, but it was a very, very substantial and very positive relationship for the, for the next two decades. When Cheyenne became the maintenance base for United Airlines, that meant that all the airliners, all the aircraft, were flown here to Cheyenne to be repaired because these very same grease monkeys that had been so good at saving the airmail planes and keeping them flying were able to do literally magician's work with these aircraft. And so, being in the middle of the route, it was the easiest for all these airlines to get to, and it had the best mechanics that could be found anywhere on the planet. And this reputation continued all the way until the outbreak of World War II, and they were able to do even more remarkable things to help the war effort. The other thing that Cheyenne Airport is well, well known for is we were a B-17 modification plant for the B-17 Flying Fortress during World War II. Over 4,000 B-17s were modified in Cheyenne. In fact, there was a modification to the B-17G model, which was actually called the Cheyenne modification. It, it involved a little bicycle seat contraption in the rear turret. Nearly half of the B-17 bombers used in World War II were modified in Cheyenne. Unfortunately, the B-17 modification efforts turned out to be the beginning of the end of Cheyenne's prominent place in aviation development. While workers were busy modifying the B-17s in Cheyenne, United Airlines built a new facility designed for manufacturing and modifying the newly developed DC-4 in San Francisco. When the war ended, there was simply no need for the modification center in Cheyenne. United phased out their presence in Cheyenne, and the once thriving aviation culture moved to places like Chicago, Denver, and San Francisco. When we talk about the airmail, it seems like this archaic old thing where you have guys flying around, and but Technologically, it was probably one of the most meaningful things that happened in aviation history. 
When we think of aviation history and progress, we think of NASA and the military. It was the post office that started a lot of things uh, with, the, with the airmail. Without the airmail, we're talking about innovations like radio stations at every airport. We're talking about lighted runways. We're talking about night landings, multi-engined aircraft, long-range service. All of those things came into being because of the airmail service. And so even though the airmail only existed for less than a decade, the technological advances were phenomenal. Wyoming's impact on aviation included amazing advances in navigation and safety technology, the beginning of the stewardess profession, and a remarkable expertise in modifying aircraft to fulfill any mission. The cowboys of the sky who flew over Wyoming's rugged landscape were only the beginning of Wyoming's phenomenal contribution to aviation. These guys relied on themselves. These guys are the epitome of a modern version of the rugged individual that Americans seem to hold in such very high regard. They had machines that they couldn't rely on. They had weather that they had to face down. And so you have guys who are willing to do it just for the sheer thrill of it, for the love of it. They relied on very little else than their own skills and their own wits. And when machinery failed or when nature challenged them, they only had themselves to rely on. There was no help for them when they were being challenged by the worst that Wyoming was able to offer. So yes, I think that you know, having the same spirit, cowboy attitude about trying to get it done is exactly the way they flew.